Dr. Maida, thank you very much for joining us today and um, taking your time out uh, in your busy day. We would, uh, from the Alliance, um, we understand that you are doing some research uh, into vein reconstruction and um, that this has become a new area on the internet and an area of concern because we're a little concerned that there's going to be some uh, tourism, medical tourism, and already has been. And you being here in the United States, being a very respectable vascular surgeon and have, having done some of the CCSVI treatments, I think that you are probably uh, best you know, to answer some of the questions. So do you want to go ahead and start talking to us, talk to us a little bit about what you have found out about your research. I know that you thought about this a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm just gonna let you go ahead and have the floor and um, talk, talk about what you've been doing. Well, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks for taking the time to follow up with this. Uh, obviously a very exciting time uh, in CCSVI, uh, particularly from some of the ongoing publications that are coming out and some of the things that are allowing us to look beyond simply interventions as venoplasty and or stent placement in the jugular veins. Um, having said that, I agree with you in that whatever I say is something uh, that should be taken seriously with a caution. Caution in that we are simply evolving yet along other paths of CCSVI treatments uh, in defining what CCSVI is and finding alternative solutions or solutions in managing patients. One of the limitations that has always existed in patients that have been treated with angioplasty alone is that venoplasty is not a definitive long-term treatment. And when we buy into having angioplasty as a primary treatment, it's good in some ways that it has limited risks, but it also has the other side of it that it doesn't necessarily have longevity associated with it. Um, so having said that, the normal progression of how to reconstruct venous disease, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, falls in the realm where we have to consider surgical options. And surgical options are those of venous reconstructions, and we can talk a lot about this, um, but just to make it clear, you know, venous reconstruction is not something that is um, to be taken lightly. Venous reconstructions, particularly in the jugular veins, uh, and these are the veins that touch into the chest where they connect with the innominate veins, and the, these deep circulatory veins are ones that when reconstruction is um, approached, one has to have certain expertise at certain level of feeling comfortable with doing this. Now, fortunately uh, for me and my partners in our practice and other vascular surgeons uh, that feel comfortable in taking care of deep venous systems, uh, this is uh, really a fairly straightforward procedure, yet it has risks that need to be balanced. Um, so I think all of my uh, experience uh, as being part of the Albany Vascular Group, we're 18 vascular surgeons, it's one of the largest vascular surgery practices in the United States, and all the work we do is not just endovascular or minimally invasive, but it really touches on all aspects of vascular, whether it's arterial reconstructions or venous reconstructions. So over the course of history, we've had over 30 years of experience in major arterial and venous reconstructive work. So when it comes to trying to address or manage CCSVI or the deep jugular veins for that matter in patients with multiple sclerosis, this is to us simply an extension of trying to get some answers whether if there are valvular abnormalities or true critical stenosis with extrinsic or intrinsic compressions or webs within the jugular veins, could we benefit by surgically addressing them, by really having the opportunity to have histology to look at? As you might know, there is uh, European study that's going to be coming out and published pretty soon that's highlighting some aberrations in the, the, the amount of collagen that's present that's different mm -hmm. in patients with multiple sclerosis in the jugular veins as it when compared mm -hmm. to patients without yes. that. We also know that there's some work done in cadaveric um, uh, patients with MS versus without in finding and, and what the findings have been from Cleveland Clinic is that patients with MS clearly had higher incidence of 
septal abnormalities or valvular abnormalities at the base of their jugular veins. So all those things lead us to uh, try to better understand what are some of the other options that can help us direct our attention to surgical um, approach to the jugular veins. Now I can tell you that we've learned a lot over the past um, decades, 10, 20, 30 years or more, about venous reconstructions. And there are lots of publications in the literature when it comes to reconstructing central veins, the big veins, whether they are for subclavian venous occlusions or jugular venous occlusions or SVC or inferior vena cava. Mm -hmm. And overall, uh, the outcomes are pretty good if they're done by specialists who know what they're doing who have the expertise in managing these patients, and certainly when the right procedure is picked. And I can give you lots of examples for this, but it really at the end of the day, it comes back to picking the right procedure. And the right procedure would be dependent on what the underlying abnormality is. For instance, if you happen to have a venous occlusion, a long segment venous occlusion, then simply trying to do patchwork for that vein is unlikely to work, and we would have to find autogenous veins within the patient's body and that could probably come from the femoral veins in the thigh or even the greater saphenous veins which are superficial veins within the leg. Okay, can I stop you there? When you talk about patchwork, what are you referring to there? Sure. So there are many different ways of looking at reconstructing veins and what happens to the vein when it clots off or thrombosis or is diseased extensively is that it's usually not just a short segment, it's a long segment that's affected, particularly when there's clot within the vein, whether that's how uh, the patient started or whether that's what resulted as a, um, as a consequence of multiple interventions that were done along the path. But having said that, uh, it is rare that we will simply find a obliterated or diseased central vein that only has an isolated short segment of okay. a problem. So the okay. problem usually is a longer segment, which could be, you know, from two to three inches to four or five inches. Um, and for those kinds of things, most likely you would need to have some sort of an autogenous conduit. Now, what that means is that we would have to get femoral veins from the patient's legs and or greater saphenous veins, which are the superficial veins, which are not necessarily um, an absolute uh, requirement for the patients to maintain perfusion or, um, or maintain uh, venous drainage from their legs, so these can easily be taken. These are the same veins we take to do heart right. reconstructions okay. and do leg bypasses, uh -huh. etc. And we can make spiral larger veins from those conduits to match the size of the jugular veins. That's interesting. Uh, okay, so you can, you can match the size of the jugular vein. With okay. superficial okay. greater saphenous okay. veins, if need be. Okay. The superficial femoral vein is approximately the size of the jugular vein. The difference is that the valves in the femoral veins are just in the opposite direction than the valves in the neck in the veins. Neck. Uh, and in that case, if we were to take those valves and those veins with the valves in the leg, then we would have to flip the vein over to replace it upside down so the valve functions in the normal anatomical position uh, as it was meant mm -hmm. to be for the jugular mm -hmm. vein. But even having said that, there could be other ways of dealing with this. And once again, I say this with caution because this is very early and experimental and to a point where I think we really need to be guarded and cautious in uh, exploring this. Mm -hmm. But having said that, what we have learned from taking care of venous insufficiency in the leg when the deep venous valves in the femoral veins and are not functioning properly is that there are different ways of fixing these valves. If we were simply to attack the valves, there's, an, uh, there's a way to fix the valves just from the outside of the veins by tightening the vein uh, wall uh -huh. so that we can bring the valve opposition closer together or by opening the veins and then plicating or suturing the valves to tighten them so they can work better. Um, so, you know, there are lots of different ways. It just happens to be that we have to be very smart about our decision tree in finding the best solution we possibly can for any particular situation that arises. Mm -hmm. I agree with you that um, there is a component of tourism that can start mm -hmm. with this just as it can with any other therapy that is scarce. But what I would recommend is that people and patients do their homework in figuring out 
who their doctors are and who their physicians are that they're going to, you certainly need to have a level of expertise that is superior to manage uh, these kinds of uh, reconstructive procedures. Okay, another question for you. Now, there are some patients out there that have had maybe two, three angioplasties in the same vein. Um, that vein, I'm assuming, has had some sort of damage to it. So is the type of reconstruction surgery that you're talking about, um, are you able to attach the, the vein that you are using from the leg, are you able to go ahead and attach to the vein that has been that's a very okay. good question, Sharon, and the true answer to this remains to be found. But having said that, in veins that are narrowed even over short or longer segments, it's fairly, it's the, from a complexity of surgery itself, uh, the surgery is not that complex in taking a piece of vein from the leg and replacing a damaged piece of vein in the neck. Um, what we would have to do is make sure that we get to the entire piece of vein in the neck that might be already damaged. So we would have to make sure that we don't leave, leave segments of veins behind um, in replacing mm -hmm. that. So I think overall that can be done. I think how this unfolds remains to be determined as our experience with this grows and uh, we try to understand what are the best solutions to some of these very complex problems. Okay, now are you going ahead and uh, doing an actual study um, with an IRB or, okay, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, so what we are in the process of right now is uh, in the process of organizing a study that would absolutely take a look at patients that had interventions, that had benefit from interventions that have subsequently failed, or patients that never had an intervention but would fall into the inclusion criteria for venous reconstruction for a variety of reasons. Our experience so far has been of those patients that had prior stents placed uh, you know, by uh, others mm -hmm. that subsequently went on to thrombose and patients had symptoms that were compressive uh, secondary to the stents and uh, secondary to maybe stent failure, but mostly compressive symptoms that could occur in the neck from movements, and patients can certainly have an irritation or feel that. I, I'm not sure if that's the norm, because it's a rare patient that comes back and says they can feel their stent, but we have certainly seen that. And in those situations, particularly when some of the imaging even shows the stent is overextending beyond even the jugular vein and is completely occluded, in those particular scenarios, we have gone down the path of reconstructing the jugular veins, but that work has primarily been done to relieve patients of their symptoms, of the discomfort that they are having okay. from a foreign body, essentially from mm -hmm. a step that's in their jugular veins. What we have learned in that is that patients have benefited from that in their jugular veins, have stayed open when we use pieces of femoral veins to reconstruct them as well as their symptoms have improved. And I wouldn't use the word significantly because their experience is very small and anecdotal right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, all the evidence that we are learning uh, about uh, how patients are feeling from these surgeries, from a, uh, measuring their uh, functional composite scores and measuring their MS quality of life sure. scores, uh, they all tend to be towards the improved symptoms. Uh, that you know, patients will tell you uh, how much different they are feeling now than they had for years uh, when they were not mm -hmm. treated with MS and or patients that clearly saw benefit from an intervention got worse when the vein occluded and the symptoms recurred and they have gone back to uh, feeling much better. Uh, but once again, this is purely, purely subjective yeah. and not objective so far, so once again, I'm not trying to say that, listen, have a jugular venous bypass yeah, and that's the exactly. end of it. Exactly. Well, I appreciate that. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about as far as what you're doing here at the Vascular Center for CCSVI for MS patients? Uh, you know, anything new that you want to update some of the, uh, you know, from the prior interview that we've had with you um, as far as your studies or anything like that? Sure. Well, as you know, we've learned a lot over the past few years uh, with the implications of CCSVI and multiple sclerosis. Um, 
but I think we have a lot more to learn. Right. And every time we get a few answers to a few questions, we clearly realize that we have a lot more questions than we have answers. Uh, so today, I think uh, our pursuit to trying to find answers to the CCSVI riddle uh, with MS patients continues. We are working with currently with FDA in trying to design new protocols mm -hmm. that we can collaborate with them so we can have a better understanding okay. about this uh, entity. Ideally, like I've always said, the most perfect study would be a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, randomized trial, uh, which we initially were enrolling patients with, but now we are focused on evolving that study with the FDA mm -hmm. through an IDE. So uh, let's see where that takes us. But uh, there's, I think, a lot of different data sets that are coming out. We are today understanding better data about the morphology of central veins, the morphology of valvular abnormalities, possibility of different collagen matrices or different types of collagen uh, that might exist in patients with multiple sclerosis in their jugular veins mm -hmm. than it does in non-MS patients. And certainly some of the work that's being done in chiropractic literature that is clearly emerging, and I'm not a good spokesman for that, but I certainly have my eyes and ears open in better understanding some of the work that's been done behind the scenes with imaging, with CSF drainage, and how all these things might or might not be involved. But I'm excited to know that a lot more people than just a few of us today are diving into this. And um, I can tell you that four years ago or three years ago, we had a debate at Charing Cross in London about CCSVI being an entity of multiple sclerosis versus yes. not. And I remember talking to Mike Dake about it, about it was three years ago, I believe, when I think one or two percent of the entire audience full of vascular surgeons and interventionalists bought into that CCSVI might be an entity of multiple sclerosis. We had a similar debate just a few months back and the audience polled 37%, over one-third that believed that CCSVI, based on currently available evidence, is yes. an entity of multiple sclerosis. So I think we're moving the pendulum in a direction. I hope it's the right direction. We certainly want to follow where the data takes us. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your compassion for the MS patient and for your work and uh, for your dedication to the MS community. So well, thank, thank you, you very much for your time. It Appreciate has been it. a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.